Welcome, everyone, to the Alan P. Kirby, Jr. Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. Uh, and it's also the location of Hillsdale and DC's newly launched Steve and Amy Van Andel Graduate School of Government. Um, my name is Dr. Matthew Meehan. Um, I am the Director of Academic Programs here at the Kirby Center. And I teach both the undergraduates who come visit from the main campus in Hillsdale, Michigan, uh, and also in the grad school, uh, as well as other more bureaucratic duties. Uh, but I also get the privilege of conducting some of these book interviews. Uh, so before uh, uh, I go any further, uh, I want to introduce uh, Richard K. Vetter. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Independent Institute and distinguished emeritus professor of economics at Ohio University. And I uh, just met a number of his students uh, who came all the way out from there tonight. So that's a, it's a great honor for a teacher to have loyal students who will travel. Uh, that's great. Uh, he has been senior econ uh, economist at the US Joint Economic Committee and visiting fellow at the Center for the Study of American Business, Washington University, uh, in my hometown, St. Louis. Uh, besides his most recent book, Dr. Vetter is also the author of Going Broke by Degree, Why College Costs Too Much. His articles have appeared in numerous scholarly journals, The Wall Street Journal, Christian Science Monitor, National Review, Washington Times, and Investors Business Daily. Uh, and relevant to our purpose tonight, and perhaps also his most impressive accolade, Professor Vetter uh, has been a teacher for 55 years? Oh, oh 54 years, 54 55 years, something. I, so. I lose count at my age. I can't count very well. <laughs> but it's something like that, yes. Wise and experience. Uh, he, he also has deep roots in Illinois. That makes him a Midwestern Westerner, thereby earning him the title to be held hereafter in perpetuity of good people. So yes, that's, that's right. Good. I'm from St. Louis. My wife's from Springfield, Illinois. Uh, and for you Gen Xers in the crowd, I regret to inform you that he is, I believe, no relation to Eddie Vedder, lead singer. Uh, absolutely Pearl none. Jam. Never met the guy. Even though Eddie Vedder, Eddie Vedder is from Evanston, Illinois. Uh, uh, but a school that I attended, actually, exactly. is in that town. Right. Uh, and I will try to use some uh, references to lyrics to Pearl Jam throughout the interview. Um, but I'd like to thank you, Dr. Vetter, for writing this uh, book, Restoring the Promise, Higher Education in America. The Kirby Center here in DC, on Hillsdale College in general, we uh, care a lot about trying to build up and enrich uh, constitutional self-government in our country. Uh, and I was just teaching the grad program the other day, we were going through Aristotle's politics, wherein Aristotle just sort of drops this bomb. Oh, by the way, if you actually care about politics, statesmanship, and leadership, your fundamental concern would obviously be the education that perpetuates the regime. Uh, it's just sort of a startling just drop. Um, and you've applied much of your career and now this book, in particular, to taking up higher education, where future educators and future leaders in pretty much all fields are formed and informed. That is to say, I'm very happy to have this discussion with you, especially about this subject, because it's fundamental to our concerns of the common good uh, and to the entire country and to self-government. Uh, so um, without any further ado and throat clearing, uh, I just want to sort of ask you to sort of give us the bird's eye view, the elevator pitch. Uh, what is restoring the promise, higher education in America? What's the promise? Well, I don't know what the promise is because I didn't pick the title. <laughs> uh, some uh, marketing guru picked the title, and uh, darned if I know what the promise is. <laughs> uh, uh, however, having said that, I think the promise relates to the fact that higher education is to serve the common good and is to serve society in a very positive way, and to some extent, it does that, but in some extent, it fails. And so how can we make it come closer to the ideal? And I suspect the prom restoring the promise refer refers to that. And we, but the reason I wrote the book is that there are several problems with higher education in America. We know 
all of you we know all of you know what they are uh, I'll use my fingers here uh, we don't have PowerPoint here which is great I'm grateful for that by the way I don't like sharing a bite I, I hate PowerPoint. hate PowerPoint I'll use what I call and I hope this doesn't offend anyone West Virginia PowerPoint I'll use my fingers <laughs> uh, 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 the, he does not speak for the college. <laughs> <laughs> Hillsdale College has already disowned you. Dr. Vetter, do you want to leave now? <laughs> uh, no. First, college is too expensive. I mean, everyone agrees with that. There isn't a person in America who seriously disagrees with that. Some people, apologists for higher ed, will say, it's still a good bargain. You're still getting your money's worth. But the reality is the costs in higher ed, however measured, have risen vastly faster than the rate of inflation, et cetera, for many, many years. And I can go into that in a minute, but let's get just do the uh, short and dirty version of this. Now, the second thing has happened, and this is more scandalous, and I hesitate to say this in front of my own students, but Let's face it, people aren't learning as much as they used to, and they're not learning enough. And maybe they're learning the wrong things. And uh, there's all sorts of empirical evidence, and some of it's a little snippy, a little limited, because it's funny. In higher ed, we, 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 we are in the knowledge business. We like to report every little facet of every human endeavor. But the one thing we're not very, we're a little neglectful on, is do we measure whether our kids are learning anything? Are they doing better now than, uh, than they did a generation ago? Do seniors know more than freshmen? Do the graduates of Hillsdale College learn more in their four years at Hillsdale than the graduate of Yale? There's a Yale student in the audience. I'll pick on Yale. Uh, and my guess is the answer is yes, but I can't prove it. So there's that issue. And with that is the whole issue of of suppression of ideas, the lack of intellectual diversity in universities, and so forth. So that's the second area of problems. Uh, uh, I actually, uh, somewhere I think I might have a great quote from, of all people, Thomas Edison, who in 1921 told the New York Times that, you know, I did, look, I, ha I hire a lot of college graduates, and I think they're abysmally ignorant. That was in 1921. We fast forward 100 years, and I think they know less than the people in 1921 knew. So where are we? The third problem, and then I'll keep quiet, is are the students today who are spending 25, 50, 100,000, 200,000 dollars going to college, and some of them go to yuppie private preparatory schools, such as one that you teach at. I, I'm picking on you. But, it's the huge uh, field of uh, yuppies. The, the, a world of yuppies. Uh, and do they get good jobs after they graduate? Some of them do. Some of them do very well. Uh, my students are all uniformly brilliant, and they're all going to end up making tons of money someday. Or, if not tons of money, tons of satisfaction. Uh, that's not true. Uh, you just look at them, you can see. Uh, uh, but they're going to do reasonably well. But the reality is a lot of kids go to college today and they don't graduate. Not at Hillsdale, where 90-some percent of the kids graduate. But at schools around the country, 40% of the kids who enter college do not have degrees six years later, not four years later, not five years later, six years later. They don't have college degrees. So you lose 40%. And then many of the others uh, uh, who do graduate uh, are, are living in their parents' basement. So the, the, there's three problems, and there are others we could talk about, but I've talked long enough. Sorry. No, yeah. The, I wonder if we just take each of these one at a time for a little while. Okay. Uh, and and uh, and when we do, I sort of what I what I what I most want to know is sort of who do I get to blame, right? So who is it? The higher ed's problem? Is it uh, is it a societal change? 
Is it a governmental change? Sure. Uh, but with regard to cost, um, who do we, where do we point the finger to get well, to find the problem? That's it's a good question. Let I I assign a large percentage of the blame to horrors of horrors, the federal government, the government of the United States of America. And to think that I'm saying this within a stone's throw or a long stone's three throw. Three blocks. Three blocks, four blocks. Uh, at a younger age, I could have thrown a stone and hit the U.S. Capitol from here. But Again, he does not speak for the college. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a large part of the problem is a federal problem. And... And I hear it's just as simple as can be. Uh, the federal government made a nice decision, seemingly, seemingly, it wasn't a nice decision, 50 years ago. We want to help poor, we want to increase access to higher ed. We want to help low income people go to college. Sounds like a nice thing. Well, 50 years ago, 10% of college, recent college graduates came from the bottom quarter of the income distribution, from the, let's call them poor people, 10%. No, 12%, sorry, 12%. I shouldn't have had that glass of wine before I talked. Now it's down to 10. It's down to 10. It's less today. Higher ed is still largely for middle class and upper class people. Not entirely, but still largely. But we put this in to help poor people. What did it do? What did it do? What did the colleges do when they said, ooh, kids can borrow money and uh, up to the cost of attendance? And uh, uh, so what did the colleges do? They started raising their fees aggressively, except, and, and I'm really serious about this, except Hillsdale College and a few others, a very, 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 very few others. So... Here's a little factoid. Before 1978, going back to 1840, 138 years of American history, the price of college rose 1% a year, more than the overall inflation rate. And that might be explained by the, some of the arguments that people use today, that it's a service industry. It's hard to substitute professors in a classroom with machines, those kind of arguments. And a gentleman in the audience is shaking his no, head no, and he's right about that too. But we'll, for the moment, let's just kind of buy that argument. That might explain a little bit, because as the economy of the whole nation got better and richer, we had to pay professors more. And even though they weren't teaching any more students than before, we still had to pay them more. So be, per student, Cost rose a little. Maybe that would explain the 1%. Since 1978, fees have gone up 3% a year. Not 1% a year, 3% a year. You say, no big deal. Do a compounding. 3% a year compounded doubles every 24 years. Over a course of a half, less than a half a century, it quadruples. Tuition fees have tripled since the adjusting for inflation since the late 70s. A large part of that is due to the government involvement. Bill Bennett said it perfectly. He was a former Secretary of Education, uh, 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 by the way, a philosophy graduate of Williams College, trained in classical uh, training. Uh, uh, Bill Bennett said this in 1978 in a New York Times op-ed, and it's true today. So, I mean... No great revelation. So the student loan program and the federal government generally, and I could, I, I could elaborate on this. Uh, the, the, I could tell you rich stories about the Department of Education and its creation. Let me tell one real quick. This is just too good to pass up. Uh, in 1976, Jimmy Carter was elected president of the United States. Uh, he promised a Department of Education. Well, why did he promise a Department of Education? Was anyone clamoring for a Department of Education? Yes, the National Education Association, NEA, uh, 
the teachers unions. He didn't do anything for two years. Jimmy's a little slow sometimes. A nice man, by the way, I met Jimmy Carter. My wife and I had drinks and ate with Jimmy Carter. We try to eat dinner with all kinds of different people, and Jimmy was one of them. In 79, Jimmy Carter, Hamilton Jordan, his chief of staff, said, Jimmy, President Carter probably, President Carter, you have to deliver on a Department of Education. And uh, Carter said, why? Well, NEA wants it. Okay. What was the reaction of the general public when Carter said, I'm going for the Department of Education? What did the Washington Post say? It's a dumb idea. The Washington Post. What did the New York Times say? We're against it. The New York Times was against it. What did the most respected intellectual of the era on the progressive side say? Daniel Patrick Monaghan. It's a dumb idea. It passed in the House of Representatives in the Education Committee by three votes. Barely made it through. Barely made it through Congress. But they approved it anyway. Narrowly got through and became law. What's the department done since? Is higher ed better off than it was 50 years ago? Is public education, K through 12 education, better off than it was 50 years ago? Uh, are we, as a nation, have progressed in this uh, four decades? Uh, I, I look at the data. I look at the evidence. Uh, and by the way, I, I've been on a public school board, elected public official on public school boards. I, at the K through 12 level, I've looked at it on, throughout the whole thing. I don't see an iota of improvement. And I see in some ways we're worse off. We're paying more, we're getting less, and we're being directed by bureaucrats and educrats who live here in Washington, D.C., when sometimes us people out in the boondocks of uh, wherever, the middle part of uh, flyover country, Good that name. I'm from flyover country, I'm profess, I'm not quite as smart as some of you people live on the East Coast where knowledge is much greater, or on the West Coast where Beware knowledge is greater. I'm part of the, uh, the, the, the planes. D d dumb middle part of the country. But some of those people in the dumb middle part of the country aren't quite as dumb as you make it out to be. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think we uh, do, uh, did all right then. Anyway, I'm sorry. No. I'm, I'm talking too much. <laughs> well, but it's, 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 it's a question I have that with regard to costs. So the, 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 the occasion for this ramp up, this exponential ramp up, uh, is the f federally backed loans, right? The, the, yes. But don't we still fault higher ed for sort of greedily grabbing at it? And oh, well. Saddling the, all these students with. Well, the uh, higher ed, of course, grabbed at it. And, uh, and what about the families? Not oh, the, 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 yeah, the families be damned. Uh, well, uh, more, more or less. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I will say there are exceptions. Uh, we're in the temple of exceptions here at Hillsdale. But, you know, Grove City College, there's some other colleges that have done similar things and have said, just say no to the federal programs. So the federal programs have, have been the basis for it, allowed the colleges to do it. But people are, who run colleges, they're decent people. They're not all mean people. They don't all beat their wives or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, they're morally, they like to say they're a little bit better than the rest of it. I don't know whether they're better or worse, but they're normal people. And they're tempted they can say, hey, we can raise our fees 6% a year instead of 4% a year. And if we do that, we can lower teaching loads for the faculty. If we do that, we can hire 42 more administrators. And we can get these uh, people who are yelling and screaming about diversity and inclusion who are giving us a hard time. We can hire 42 more diversity coordinators. How many diversity coordinators are there at the University of Michigan? 
How many? Last I counted, 93. 93. 27 of them making more than 100,000 a year. You're shocked. I'm not. I live in higher ed. I see it all the time. And I'm not picking just on that field. You do the same thing with public relations specialists. You do the same thing with athletic programs. You do the same thing across the board. And uh, it is an outrage. My university, which is a typical state university, in the mid-70s had two faculty members for every one administrator. Now we have, for every two faculty members, two and a half administrators, more administrators than faculty. In fact, I propose to the president of the university, why don't you give every faculty member their own administrator? Uh, reorganize the university. We'll give every faculty member sort of like a valet, administrative valet. And uh, I think it'd be a cool idea. Sorry, I'm. No, that's, that's good. The, 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 well, so is the, pro is the proposed solution for the federal loan program do what Hillsdale's done, get off of, of the sort of crystal meth uh, that's sort of driving everything? Yeah. yeah. Or, or are you proposing get rid of the legislation altogether that it has no public utility? That well, I would love to get rid of the, the legislation. I really would. But I used to work for the gang of 535 that is across the street, roughly. That, that is to say the U.S. Congress. I've worked there. I know those people. I've lived with those people. Have I said enough? Uh, uh, they're not going to do it. And I don't blame them. I mean, from a job security point of view, most Americans think it's a cool program. And you don't want to get rid of something that's cool. And uh, so the, uh, what is the solution? Well, one group of Americans, uh, uh, is, and I don't want to tie it specifically to political parties, but in this current environment, we see it, especially among progressive Democrats, uh, the Elizabeth Warren, the, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, but now pretty much all of them say, let's just forgive the debt. Why don't we just say, forgive the debt? What the heck? We just let them, what's another trillion dollars or two or trillion? You know, we're running, by the way, Every day, $3 billion deficit, the federal government. Every day, do the math, $125 million an hour, $2 million a minute. Do the math further, 30 some thousand a second. And the time it took me to say that, we ran up another half million dollars of debt. And here we are in this environment of total political irresponsibility and both parties Republican, Democrat, Vegetarian, Presbyterian, whatever political party you belong to. Uh, and we're talking about forgiving a trillion dollars worth of debt, a trillion and a half dollars. We're going to tell people who've worked hard their lives paying off that debt, we're going to say, yo, you were suckers. You were, you were suckers. <laughs> you actually believed the government, didn't you? Tough, but the other people who bought second homes or uh, took out big mortgages uh, and took trips to Europe and so forth and didn't pay down their debt, you don't owe any more. Free at last. I think that's shameful. What do you think that does to future obligation? What do you think it tells Americans? in terms of meeting their obligation. What does it say about meeting the sanctity of contracts? What does it say about the rule of law? It is horrible. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. I think I made that clear, didn't I? So I'll be quiet. So I, w I wonder, I mean, you have this other question, the sort of the problem of the content, right? The price, the, the, a family's willingness to take on debt is an it's right. It's an evaluation of the relative worth of the degree. Yeah, that's right. Right, and I wonder if the problem would be alleviated somewhat if the American people, families, parents, high school students, w were better at appraising the relative value. It, that is true. There's one thing. Uh, 
I've been condemning the government. I suppose I should be at least halfway nice to the government for maybe seven or eight seconds. Uh, today, today, the federal government announced that they, in their college scorecard, which is a document where you can download information college by college, they report the average earnings, alleged average earnings of graduates uh, by college. And now they are giving you the data even by major. So you could look at, you can't look at Hillsdale because Hillsdale is verboten, they're out of the system. Hillsdale's not in because they refuse to kowtow to the federal government. But most schools, you can look, for example, at my university, I looked up economics majors, and I learned that the average earnings after graduation was $30,000. And I said, my gosh, that strikes me as awfully low. Well, and I learned that the average debt of students is $25,000 upon graduation. That statistic is probably fairly close to accurate. So that's a nice kind of statistic. And you could do this for any college anywhere. The, the young lady here for, who's sitting in the fourth row from Yale, uh, but who uh, is still looking for a job, uh, 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 that's probably 72,000 at Yale. And their debt is less because Yale drops money out of airplanes over their students. Uh, because they got a $25, 30000000000 billion endowment. So, uh, but you get that statistic, and that's kind of good information. So the federal government has the potential of providing information. Turns out there's only 47 Ohio University economics graduates in the sample. When there are hundreds and thousands of these, only 47 made the sample. And then it turns out, oh, you don't get in the sample unless you had borrowed money from the federal government to begin with. Well, there are a lot of people who don't borrow money from the federal government. So the data is vastly distorted, just horrendously distorted. But it's an attempt, the attempt is a good one. And I've talked to Secretary DeVos, who I think is an honorable person uh, from the state of Michigan. I see the Van Andel name on this very building, uh, uh, associates of the DeVos family from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, wonderful family, wonderful people. But uh, I love Betsy DeVos, uh, but I wish they would close their operation down and maybe it's time to let the Georgetown University ROTC have a bombing practice over Maryland Avenue in Washington where the Department of Education is located. Anyway, Again, I digress. Again, he does not speak for the college. <laughs> uh, yes, so uh, barring uh, airstrikes, um, the last time I, I heard anyone credibly, uh, a candidate, credibly call for the destruction of the Department of Ed was uh, Bob Dole. Was, yeah. That was part of his loud platform was the big, the big push. Uh, How old is Bob Dole now? 142? Right, 143? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> one of the things I found very interesting about your, 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 your book is, is sort of you deeply ensconced in the economics of higher ed, who's paying for what, right? Where's the government funding, what state schools um, versus the Ivy League or the, 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 the plucky liberal arts college or, um, or the uh, citadel of reason that is Hillsdale? Like, where are these, who's paying for what? Well, that's a good question and I can't answer the question definitively. But I would say that there are a lot of people who are seeking educational attainment of some sort who are really getting relatively little from the federal government. What about the person who graduates from high school who is not academically terribly interested in academic affairs and not very adept, but is pretty good with their, his hands or her hands and wants to work as a welder? or a plumber, uh, but it's gonna take a year or two of training to make that happen. Or take this brainy, very brainy, high IQ kid who's good at coding, whatever coding is, something to do vaguely with computers, I'm told, 
and very good, and they can go to a coding academy, and in six months, if they're good, learn a lot and get a job paying sixty or seventy or eighty thousand a year, and uh, the, the whole cost of the coding academy experience is fifteen or twenty thousand. Those people are getting almost nothing from the federal government, almost nothing. The kids who go, and I'm picking on Yale, and Yale's a nice school. Uh, it, some would say it's the best in the Ivy Leagues. Uh, 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 and uh, I sort of agree. I kind of like Yale. It's got, it's got that yuppie uh, look of uh, Harry Potter look about it that's very nice. I, I always thought Harry Potter was one of the most positive recent contributions to Western civilization. <laughs> and uh, uh, why are we giving more to the kids that go to Yale who come from relatively well-to-do families to begin with? And not only what we give to the kids. But how do we give to Yale? Well, that's right. How do we give to Yale? How I did a study once comparing Princeton University. I'll, uh, the, uh, the gal from Yale is having heartburn back there, so I will now pick on Princeton for a minute, if I may. Uh, here's two schools, tale of two schools. How far apart are they? 11 miles. One of them is called Princeton University. The other one, until recently, was called Trenton State University. It is now called College of New Jersey, which is the original name of Princeton. A brilliant marketing move on their part, by the way. Here are these two colleges. We call Princeton a private school. We call the College of New Jersey a public school. How much money does the public school, College of New Jersey, get directly or indirectly? Direct government subsidies, uh, gifts, uh, grants to students, research, whatever. Maybe three, four, five thousand dollars per student. State of New Jersey adds a couple thousand dollars, maybe six, seven thousand. Let's exaggerate. What does Princeton get? Princeton gets the advantages of tax deductions uh, uh, against uh, income, uh, which uh, fund a ton of things, uh, donations to uh, buildings. Uh, for example, there's Whitman College at Princeton. Any of you been to Princeton? Whitman College at Princeton. Lovely, lovely place. Named after Meg Whitman, uh, a minor figure in American public finance, uh, eBay fame, et cetera, et cetera, H, whatever else she did. She gave, this little college was built, a little dorm for the kids at Princeton. 350 kids lived there. It's got stained glass windows. Ceiling in the dining room is 34 feet high. I had it measured. Uh, I talked to people on the, what's the newspaper in Princeton? Great student newspaper there. They checked this out for me. Uh, the building cost $129 million to build for 350 students. This was a decade ago, about $350,000 a student. Meg Whitman got zillions of dollars reduced. Her tax burden was reduced by millions. And I have nothing against Meg Whitman. Uh, I have nothing against Princeton. But so we gave a lot of benefit to these people. If you were a progressive liberal Democrat, I think the best stand to take today to be different than the people that are running is to say, I want to help the poor. I want to do away with federal programs. I want to do away with these programs that are helping the rich, the people that go to Heights School. This is where he teaches. I'm, I'm really being mean to you just now. Any institutions uh, that any he was involved with, just make fun of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I shouldn't. That was beyond the pale. I should not have said that. But uh, to people. And that's why I love Hillsdale. I really do. Because it has got principles. But again, what would be the solution to this problem, I mean, is it an education problem? We just need to, people need to understand? Well, there are, there are ideas out there. We're not gonna change this overnight, and let's accept that. So if you wanna be practical, and let's be uh, politically uh, reasonable for a sense, there are some ideas out there that would 
Nick, get at the problem and start to do something about it. Do we really need to give student loans to people who are in graduate school for their eighth or ninth year and getting an MBA at Harvard? Could we put some limits on the student loan program? That's one approach. Put limits on. Uh, could we say, let's make it clear that people can go to college and sell equity in themselves rather than debt in themselves. When a person goes to college and takes out a loan, they are, in effect, there's an IOU involved here. IOU, the federal government, $20,000, $30,000. That's what it is. It's a, it's a debt instrument. Why don't they issue equity interests in themselves? Uh, why don't they sell stock in themselves? I will give you 7% of my earnings for the first five years after I graduate if you give me $50,000 for my college. Income share agreements, ISAs they're called. Why don't, they're not illegal, but there's some doubt in the law whether they're enforceable contracts. And there are some who say, oh, this is indentured servitude, and you come up with purple language to describe them. I think they're perfectly legitimate contractual arrangements. So there are some things we could do that would wean us away from the student loan program and involve the private sector and incidentally get the government out of the business, because this could all be done. Uh, 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 J.P. Morgan Chase or... Uh, Bank of America or uh, anyone could do this. Rocket, not rocket loans, what is it called? Oh, anyway, Quicken loans, whatever, you know. Someone could do this uh, in the private sector. So there are alternatives to what we're doing. And what about the, we sort of touched on it a little with regard to uh, people who are going for non, you know, non-higher ed routes to their careers. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about that, about you know, coming up with trade schools and making sure that there's not this sort of notion that you're not a real person if you don't get the four-year degree marker. Um, but, uh, but what about the careers afterward problem? I mean, that's, that's the, one of the, 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 we haven't talked enough about the third leg of the stool in terms of p part of the higher ed crisis. And... Um, and what can we do to better the reporting that you were talking about? I mean, well, uh, uh, taking the first thing is, I, I hate to say this in an audience of college students and college graduates, but I think there are two we've over-invested in higher ed in one sense. We put too much money into traditional four-year degree programs uh, and too much money into people getting a diploma for the sake of getting a diploma. And the government plays a little role in this. You know, President uh, Obama promised we would have the highest percentage of, uh, uh, of graduates. You know, we were at slipping behind other nations, and we'll get back to number one. There are foundations out there. The Lumina Foundation from Indianapolis is one, and... Uh, other foundations who uh, say our goal, the Gates Foundation, is to increase the percentage of Americans with degrees. Uh, so there is a push, sort of mindless push for people to get four-year degrees. And we probably ought to emphasize more uh, these other alternatives than we have. So that's part of what we ought to be doing is putting more emphasis on these other things. And uh, I think the federal government uh, is, as I, I indicated earlier, a large part of the problem. But uh, uh, state governments have contributed to this, too, and, and others. And uh, well-meaning private people have contributed to this. I, don't, I think the government ought to get out of the higher ed business uh, in a perfect world. Uh, but I'll accept the fact that we're going to have government in the higher ed business and uh, say, how can we re reform it? And one way is to privatize some parts of it, like the lending process. 
uh, to reduce the advantages of, of associated with this sort of $130 million dormitories and uh, you give them money to a stadium project, uh, you get a tax deduction for that so you can watch people throw balls back and forth. I mean, what's the public policy object reason why we subsidize people throwing balls? I have nothing against throwing balls. I kind of like to watch football games once in a while, basketball games even more. Uh, but why do we subsidize this stuff? Why? It makes zero sense whatsoever, and uh, in my opinion. Isn't there something on the sort of moral plane of a kind of uh, a basic re-education about comfort? <laughs> that there's sort of like, uh, when I think of my own, and I was in a dinosaur uh, environment that hadn't gotten with the times, it was sleepy and small, my undergrad was one of the last lousy cafeterias. Uh, and I was going to school in the 90s. Uh, and, and, uh, and then I went back and visited there later on as an alum, and it had become unbelievably luxurious, uh, just beautiful, uh, with 50 different sort of well, the, the, parfait stations and things like that. And it was still nothing compared to most of the mainstream schools. No, that's one of the problems. I mean, higher ed is, there's, I called it once in a Wall Street Journal piece I wrote, the country clubization of higher ed. And there is that. I mean, you've got to have, I mean, we're, these kids are, they're, they're, they're living in absolute poverty and because there is, we don't have a, a lazy river at our school. You've got to have a lazy river at you your school. You have to explain what a lazy river is. A lazy river is what we used to call a swimming pool, but instead of being 100 feet long, it's 1,000 feet long. And, it's, uh, and you can rent a, a little raft, and if it's at a progressive school that most of these are, it has a little place on the raft. I've seen some of these uh, inner tube where there's room for a cup to put your beer in while you go down the river and contemplate life and get stoned or drunk or whatever kids do these days. And uh, why the heck should we subsidize this kind of stuff? So th there is a lot of that and fancy dorms and so on. That's part of it. Another manifestation of the rising costs of higher ed is an area I already mentioned is administrative bloat. And I, it's bad on a cost basis. It costs a lot of money. But what's worse is it's crowding out the academic function of a university. The academic function is getting downgraded by people who are uh, functionaires, I think the French might call them, uh, people who are doing uh, things uh, that have nothing to do with learning, but a lot to do with other things. I mentioned diversity and inclusion as an example, but I could have mentioned even fundraising as an example, uh, where universities are just overwhelmed with administrators, and, it, and there's a lot of evidence for this. Uh, up the road, by the, is the greatest arguer for this is a guy up at uh, Hopkins in Baltimore, uh, uh, Ben Ginsburg, a great guy, Benjamin Ginsburg. He's a professor of political science. He's probably politically, uh, you know, a left of uh, Elizabeth Warren, for all I know. But he is, he says the universities are being destroyed by administrators. We no longer make the decisions. We're no longer in charge. And whether the faculty ought to be in charge is a debatable issue. I'm not sure they should be totally in charge. Uh, I am not sure I'd buy a used car from the average faculty member. But uh, they are doing what universities are supposed to do. They're creating and disseminating knowledge and ideals and virtue. Virtue, by the way, has gone by the wayside at most schools. Uh, you know, there are some exceptions, but most schools. We don't care about the or, virtue. Or they've decided to try a new idea of what virtue is. Yeah. Vigorously trying to train everyone in 
virtues that may not actually be virtues. Yeah, uh, I think uh, virtues that in the sweep of Western civilization over the last several thousand years would not be considered virtues anyway. You know, I mean, they're being put. So before we open up to questions from the audience, and uh, do please, if, uh, when we do, we'll have microphones uh, for you. So just raise your hand, and I'll, 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 I'll call on you one at a time. Um, I want to just sort of ask you to sort of, uh, ask, this is Washington, a lot of people who actually really care about trying to make the doable change to sort of touch off the first snowflakes at the top of the mountain, they could start an avalanche and actually get something done uh, in, with, to solve big problems with little changes. If you had to say, if you were talking to a room of interested people like this and donors and politicians and said, what are we all going to rally around? What, where do we put the very tip of the spear and all of our weight? What would you choose as the one thing to push on? I know usually solutions are multivalent and you've got to do a lot, but if you had to pick one, what would it be and why? Well, you're being nasty to me. You're expecting me. Uh, I'm good at criticizing people, but <laughs> solutions? Uh, I'm a lowly college professor in Appalachia, uh, you know, eking out a bare existence uh, 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 teaching. As I said to begin with, in a practical sense, and in a Washingtonian sense looking at Washington, I suspect the single most important thing that we could do would be to work to downsize and change the student loan program, which would help with the cost side and the money that those programs raise through higher tuition fees, pay for all these administrators and lazy rivers and uh, uh, $17 million football coach. Well, they don't pay for the, seven, the football coaches. Football coaches, by the way, pay for themselves at the really good schools. They, they, I'm not saying they're all virtuous, Au contraire, but that, that but but that's what I would do. I would work on getting the government out of the business of doing the harm that they do the most, and the most single harm they do is in this area. So, can we let it go at that? We'll have to. Very good. So, questions? Uh, yes, please. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, I wanted to ask if uh, this problem that you've outlined here isn't something that's sort of common in human affairs. It's a lack of good governance. And I'm wondering what sort of structures uh, academic institutions could uh, adopt and that would improve that. In this very room, uh, a few weeks ago, there was a presentation about the uh, problem at Oberlin College. And uh, it really sounds outrageous. Uh, you can look at the corporate world and look at the way uh, a, a, a corporate board of directors uh, works, uh, but it seems to me that alumni, if you were talking about stockholders, when you graduate, if you, if you become a shareholder in the, in the uh, university or so, you have kind of a vested interest in protecting the reputation of your, your sheepskin or whatever. And it seems to me that there are a lot of ways to approach this problem. Do you have any comment on that? Well, I think university governance is horrible the way it, it happens, and that gets to your question. Boards of trustees at universities are, well, I think mostly well-intended people or tr truly interested in their college and so forth, but they, they're clueless about two-thirds of the bad things that happen at campus. Uh, I don't know the specifics of the Oberlin College details, but I'm sure that the Board of Trustees of Oberlin College, a large majority of them, didn't have a clue what was going on at Gibson's Bakery in, in, in Oberlin, Ohio, uh, that has led to embarrassment to Oberlin, tens of millions of dollars of potential damage for them, hurt the college greatly, led to some absolutely grotesque uh, behavior on the part of administrators who should have been, frankly, just fired. Uh, and uh, so in my, I don't want to keep trying to sell my book because both people that have read it have liked it. 
Uh, 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 we will be selling books. Right we will be here. selling books at a, a fairly reasonable price. And uh, if you, uh, I will leave an autograph them if you want, which I doubt you will. But uh, the uh, there is a governance issue in higher ed that uh, who owns the universities? Who runs the universities? Well, the faculty think they do. They don't usually, but they think they do. And at some schools, they have a lot of power. Larry Summers was president of Harvard University. He was secretary of the treasury. He was Mr. Everything. He got fired. Who fired him? The faculty. He didn't like the notion that women were as good at math as men or something. So that's basis for firing, I guess. So... Uh, the, the faculty don't control the university. Uh, the alumni think they control the university. They give a lot of money. At some schools, they have some clout, but most places, they don't know, own the university. The administration probably has more claim to own the university. Who owns the universities? No one knows. Well, theoretically, it's the board of trustees or the board of governor. In Virginia, it's the board of visitors. Who's on the board of visitors? Someone the governor appoints for a few years or someone in the case of private schools that is given a lot of money, uh, wants the prestige of the name, goes to a meeting about four times a year. The president of the university fills them with good wine and drinks, gives them tickets to the football games and listens to the propaganda that they feed the board, which is, bears modest or no resemblance to what's really going on at the school. And uh, this is shameful. But, you know, do I have an easy solution for it? No, but I think that's one area I would start looking for some solutions. Sounds like you'd want to get into the, the ear of a governor and get them to take Yeah, by the way, I, I spent a year on the Spellings Commission on the future of higher education, where I was supposed to be part of a group of 20, blue ribbon group, and it really was a blue grib, ribbon group of very famous people, uh, former cabinet members, governors, uh, pres uh, presidents of universities, uh, universities like Michigan and uh, MIT and so forth. I was on this really blue ribbon group. Boy, we're going to turn education around. What did we do? My wife was right from the day one. She, I agreed to be on it. She says, you're not going to do a damn thing. <laughs> She's more or less right. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> yes, there's a question in the back there. Hi, I'm one of the Hillsdale students here on the DC program. Wonderful. Um, and at Hillsdale, we really enjoyed John Henry Newman and his work, The Idea of a University. And in that, Newman talks about how the biggest contribution a university makes to the student is teaching him or her uh, how to look at the world as an integrated whole, but also the mark that the university leaves on each student. Uh, and my question for you is, how can we as uh, college degree holders go out and teach people about this idea and communicate it? Because this really does seem like the promise of higher education that's been lacking in this post-industrial, kind of post-modern world. It's an excellent question. Uh, I missed a little bit of the part of it, but I've read uh, uh, now Cardinal, uh, now Saint Newman. He's been promoted to a saint. Uh, it's one of the few areas of life where you can die and 100 years later get promoted. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the Pope recently made uh, 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 John Henry Newman a, a, a saint. One of the greatest, wonderful pieces of things ever written. I wish every student read it, and I wish every uh, member of the Board of Trustees would read it. Uh, we don't, we've lost sight of the big things in life and the important things in life. Uh, we've lost sight. I mentioned just threw the word virtue out, as, uh, just as a sort of a shorthand version of talking about sort of the non-practical, non-vocational dimensions of higher education. We've lost sight of them. But you know, I think our nation has lost sight of a lot of the 
the things that used to be the glue that brought us together as a nation. I'll, I'm getting a little away from your question, but the glue that makes us Americans is that we all have some common thing that we hold in common, that we, that we believe in, that we believe dear to us. We're losing that. First of all, kids aren't even taking classes in history anymore at most schools. They don't know about the founding fathers. Uh, and I think that's shameful. We need to uh, move back to a, a, a core curriculum like Hillsdale has done. There's a group of us wild-eyed reformers who, who trying to remind the liberal arts colleges and in higher ed of their own tradition like to mistranslate or retranslate artes liberales, where that phrase liberal arts came from, as the arts of liberty. Just to kind of shake it up, like you're actually, part of what you're trying to teach is self-government, and that's an interior thing and an exterior political thing. Uh, and that's, I think, been lost. Uh, one more question. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, in the back. The pink shirt over there, or the blue jacket. Which are... um, so I, I work at a university, Catholic U, and all the things you, you said are, are true. I've seen it with my own where, where are you, Catholic U? Sorry? What you? At Catholic University up the road, you the three miles. You can, see, you can see the dome, the shrine from here. Um, I was reading about endowments the other day and uh, the history of it. Apparently, they go back to Greece. Um, there's, min, there's the Carolinian Renaissance. There's other nobles, I don't know, in France that the state, they were, they were the state, the nobles, the government subsidized education. Uh, so it seems to me, it seems to, me to be a, a part of the kingly power, right, of a nation. Um, it seems to be a human nature thing. Um, but you say we could do it better. Um, and the fund, endowments are different than, what is your thinking about? Because there's already so much money that we've, we've been hitting on Yale. Sorry, but uh, there's many endowments, many, many. You look, I was Googling the other day. There's so much. What is your thinking about? I mean, there's all that money there that's, and you always get news. Oh, Yale is buying land in California with their endowment um, to change the world. Yeah, yeah. So, um, sorry, that was long. Well, I, I did a piece. I, I did some serious empirical work on endowments. First of all, Adam Smith had it right in The Wealth of Nations uh, when he noted that uh, the professors at uh, Oxford University no longer teach anything anymore because the students are now, because pre, in an earlier period, the faculty got paid by the students directly. And when that stopped, uh, the faculty didn't give a damn about the students anymore, and the world went to hell, uh, which is probably a slight exaggeration, but there's an element of truth. And what happened is endowments insulate us from having to pay any attention to achieving excellence. Why, why should we? The money's coming in anyway, and, and endowment money, by the way, mostly does not support lowering costs to students. I, I, I've done empirical work on this. I run regression. Us economists, we run regression equations. I run tons of regression equations on this. The money doesn't go to support students. It does go to teach, lower teaching load for us faculty. It does go to increase salaries. Uh, it does go to do a lot of things that really I don't think justify contributions to college. And uh, this is a terrible thing to say here because I give money to colleges. I think colleges are worthwhile in endeavors. I uh, love my, college, my alma mater. I love the school I teach at. I love Hillsdale. But some people have abused that dimension of it as well. So I'm not against endowments. Uh, if I were, I, they will not broadcast this to the rest of the world because Larry Arn, who runs Hillsdale, loves endowments, and he should. He should. <laughs> but in any case, uh, endowments are an issue that need to be addressed. Well, there is an issue. What should be done with endowments? The, que the question was, why aren't they forced to use them to to lower the cost? Well, that that is a good empirical question. I I will say that when they put an endowment tax in on very very large endowments, I testified before the House Ways and Means Committee over down the road here before the Gang of Five Thirty Five, and uh, I said there's a case for it. 
and I, I usually don't promote higher taxes on anything, but a tax on, I'll say, Harvard to our young lady in the fourth row is already suffering enough. Uh, a tax on Harvard would probably, it wouldn't hurt the wor world and might help it a little bit. Hmm. Well, with that, please join me in thanking. Thank you, Dr. Venner. Thank you.